I'm AJ Bianco from Podcast PD, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows in the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. It's that time that you've all been waiting for. You are listening to the High Tech Podcast, joined by me, one of the hosts, Josh Swartz, and me, William Millingworth, the, I guess, de facto co-host then, too. I mean, like, or other host, you know? Other host. I'm the other host. Other host. folks. Yeah. You know, it depends on who opens the episode, who's the other host and who's the host. I don't. I think I, I said other. Ho- who knows? We're, we're both. What hosts. is what is a host? You know, uh, we're like someone who seats you in a restaurant. Yes, we're more like your podcast butlers. You know, we are. Huh. We, we are here. Yep. That doesn't. That didn't work either. No. I don't. Maybe <laughs> maybe there's a reason host is the word. Maybe we yeah. shouldn't try to reinvent the wheel. Anyway, this is the high tech podcast where we talk about ed tech, technology, teaching learning occasionally a nerdy thing yes. here or there you know gets yes. uh gets a good old tossed in there like oh. for instance right now we could just jump into our topic or i could say will what are your feelings on twitter's logo change come on oh. <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to put that on the record <laughs> Dude, I literally saw somebody tweet. They like went to some font stores that like sells fonts or whatever, and they they screenshot yeah. it. And they're like, um, did he, did they literally steal the this guy's X from blah 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 font? I was like, holy smokes, it's a whole it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. yeah. So make sure to follow us on X at High Tech Podcast <laughs> Doc. That's no, that works no. so great. I Let's think it would be fine that. to talk. I think it'd be fine to talk about that. You know, so it's not as a I hot topic. Mention, I feel like everybody can agree we just don't like the logo. Well, is that? It's dumb. Yeah. Anyway, um, I was going to mention the fact that I mean, it's just, okay. No, but wait, it's as dumb as when the moment when Google, right? This, 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 this household name like Twitter, when Google said, "Oh, we're gonna like put, we're gonna put Google under a parent company called Alphabet." You named your company Alphabet. Alphabet, I I don't know. I just, I, I'd re- like I'd like to say unless you sell soup, Alphabet shouldn't <laughs> be your company name, right? Like that's, yes. that's, that's all that's all I'm saying. And unless yeah. Yeah. you head up a school of mutants, X shouldn't <laughs> be your company name. X shouldn't be in your company name. Thank right? you. Yes, like, I feel the like point. these are easy these are easy well principles done, to follow. Well done. You know what I mean? I'm just saying it's it's fine. We know. Elon listens to the podcast, so he'll eventually change it. Um, my boy, my boy E. No, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. um, I, 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 I was going to say, <laughs> yeah. back it up. Uh, I was going to say the fact that Josh, you know, it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting when we get into these recording schedules where we record all over the place. Frankly, yep. folks, right? And um, we'll record an episode, I'll say, in June that launches in August. That's great for us. We're very ahead of things, but it makes the timeline. A little goofy. Yeah. The thing that also starts to mess with me is the fact that my shirts, I I had this this notion when we started doing video podcasts that I would try not to rewear my shirts in our, <laughs> any of our episodes. I in mean, any it was episodes? Like, like you would never yeah. have the same shirt ever? If, yeah, it, it wouldn't. Trust that's me, an eventually it would fall apart. notion, man. <laughs> like that? <laughs> it wasn't going to It wasn't like going to work. Shirts ain't cheap right now. Like the only way that works is <laughs> if you can like go to Target and buy their cheap V Max, but they all look the same. So that still wouldn't yeah. get your your thing. But what what starts to mess with me <laughs> even more, right, is we started recording tonight several hours ago, <laughs> and I was wearing this shirt in an episode in the in a future episode in it like not so you this know one twelve. If you hadn't broken the fourth yeah. wall, people would have just thought you did laundry. Like that's <laughs> <laughs> that's how that's how it works. No, and my my talking... washer and dryer are broken. So <laughs> oh, they're still not working. Oh, that's... my washer's broken. Yeah, it's Ooh, that's unfortunate. Um, <laughs> the uh, like you're talking across the co-host who like let's be honest, this shirt 
has shown up has in ninety in like... percent of our podcast episodes. <laughs> yes. I wear like the same shirts to work every day during the summer, especially. I have way I less. I think it's just your Tuesday options. shirt. It's, I, it's I'm just convinced Tuesday it's your Tuesday shirt. shirt. Well, I like, also have another short sleeve shirt that looks very similar to this one, and I rotate them quite often, and they okay. end up in the podcast. Uh, this Tuesday is this shirts. is the this is the branch. This is the part of the Higher Tech Podcast where we diverge from education and we talk about fashion. This is eh, we're trying. Nope, I'm out. We're trying. We literally thing. started this episode tonight, <laughs> folks. We've been we've been going at it for like three hours. Ap- this yeah we're in three hours tonight already and we said we're gonna start this episode like let's keep it short and here we are we've trailed on for five five minutes minutes. in and we're still talking about shirts maybe we should we should switch so what we're really here to talk about (laughs) that we think will engage you uh is the topic of wow student engagement you see what i did there i used engage twice in different situations yeah landed the plane twice. that's what that's what experts do folks um, so <laughs> no, we want to talk about student engagement because it's been coming up in a couple of the episodes that we've done here or recorded recently that may or may not be before or after this episode. Who knows? In <laughs> we the don't world know. Of the podcast. Um, but we want to talk about student engagement because specifically in higher ed, we are hearing this phrase thrown around a lot. Now it could be because as Will and I have posed in another episode somewhere in the high tech podcast land that I am totally not extending. Folks, this I literally see his avatar while, running all over while, our database on the left I, screen. While I look up what episode it was. 101. <laughs> wow. It's good that I remember this from memory. Nailed not it. Is higher ed dying? Episodes. Yeah. It is higher ed dying? Will and I talk about this topic uh, because we are, well, one of us is still there in the higher ed world and we, but we both have (laughs) strong opinions about the topic, but student engagement is also coming up a lot. Uh, As we were talking to uh, Sharon, Dr. Batgirl, this came up in the episode with her as well, uh, talking about how this is often thrown around that we need to engage students. We need to engage students. We need more student engagement. We need all of this. (laughs) And And we're hearing this from the news and from leadership. (laughs) Yeah. In classic fashion, from leadership side, and listen, I, I like to make jokes about this, but I do understand that, like, on one end of things, to my fellow faculty and people that I work with, the leadership is pushing this a lot because, yes, hiring is still a business. We have to serve. People are trying to survive. There are people's lives, livelihood involved in here, and still the mission of your colleges. People do genuinely care about those things. They want to keep them moving forward, at least for the most part. This is me trying to be less cynical. And so... um, (laughs) Nice try. I know. I was was trying. But this is coming up a lot, and we feel like nobody's really clearly defining necessarily what they're talking about when they're talking about student engagement. And also, I feel like we're making it more complicated than it needs to be. I don't know, Will, what your, your thoughts on this are, but the fact of the matter is the reason I feel like a lot of people are caring about this so much is because they just see people going out the doors. So now they care about student engagement. And so we throw the word around about student engagement and there's lots of strategies and and methods for doing it and things that we're going to do that, that will engage students more. And I think what prompted this, especially for Will and I to get this into the episode thing was when we were talking to Dr. Batgirl, Sharon, uh, there was a, there was a joke that we were making at that moment that like, it's not that it's, it's not that crazy to engage students. Um, and it, it, yes, it takes work, but it's not so hard to do. It's, it's about actually connecting with the students and then also creating content that they care about things like that. Right. So Will Will and I, I think wanted to talk a little bit about what, we think student engagement can look like and maybe how you can engage students more. Right. So will you did this to me in the, uh, in, in the opening AI series. So I'm going to say, okay, so 109, the listeners are listening. Yep. Give us the answers. Well, sorts you were, you were leading into it there. Like I I was literally waiting on my transition. Like, okay, the thought that I have is going to be, and then you said, I'm like, yeah, yep. That's it. This is being driven down from the top student engagement let's improve student engagement because the retention numbers aren't there the retention numbers are the leadership or the financial issue 
yeah. we can't keep the students. And hey, you know what I mean? It's that's the issue in corporate, right? When you sell something, if you can't keep the customer, if you can't get the customer to buy something, there's no more restaurants. Yeah. There's no more service. There's I, no more. I tools. prefer to sell to empty rooms. That's my. Oh, that's, that's my vibe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot left over then at the end. You know, so you just... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> easy for you to take it all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But uh, so so at this at this I, like I, I see it as a yin and a yang, right? Retention and engagement. Like, if if we just had this episode be non cynical, we wouldn't have to talk about the retention side. We'd just be like, dude, engagement's great. This is how we get the students motivated. This is how we keep them, um, in, you know, working with each other, working with you, improving their grades. Like that's the positive side of engagement. But I'll tell you. This issue being popular at this moment is a result of COVID-19 and pandemic, pandemic instruction, the issues that came out of losing people to just uh, not being able to get to school, not having the technical access at home, et cetera, et cetera. Like COVID-19 rocked the, the, this moment in time, rightly so. We were all infected so many ways. And, and so now we're just trying to get back to the bottom line stuff, and that's the retention issue at hand. This actually... This, this relationship between retention and engagement actually first came to me um, with a faculty member I was helping at my last institution where he was, he was referencing the fact that, you know, uh, he liked the class and the students that um, completed the class typically got good grades. So, so like some of, and some of the evaluations, right? His evaluations were good and that's, it's all sounded good, but he had a significant, I don't remember percentages. I don't want to ballpark, but he had a significant number of students who dropped out after the first week. And so if you, if you think about that, right, mm -hmm. if 30 students enroll and 10 of them give him great marks on evals and get great grades on their great, their, their, their finals, right? It looks like his course is fine, but he lost 20 of the students in week one. And uh, listener, let me break the fourth wall or spoil this for you. It's not because this guy was a punk. It's not because he was mean. I actually really enjoy, you know, there's some faculty who have a, sh a rough edge to them. They, they're, they're no. really, um, <laughs> don't, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> there are faculty who push their students out the door. That happens, right? But this guy wasn't necessarily that guy. He had a hard subject. It was some sort of mathematics. Maybe it was like a, a you lost engineering me or something like that. that. That immediately. Yeah, I barely spell math. I have the so. solution. Don't do math. I asked ChatGPT. Um, no, they got worse. 2% oh, success great. results. That's great, a different great. topic. <laughs> but like he, he, he brought this for me. He's like, I, what do I need to do? Like, am I, what am I missing them with in, in week one? I asked him a bunch of leading questions. I asked him, you know, how, what do you do to learn the students' names? What do you do to provide time for the students to speak themselves? What do you do for the students to... Um, you know, identify their uh, best learning methods. Like if you're a, if you're a lecturer, if you're this or if you're that, what do you, can I, I just asked him a bunch of like probing questions about what he was actually doing in week one. And I don't think he was necessarily doing anything wrong, but I'll tell you what he was doing was just jumping right into the content day one. And, and it just went hard mm. on the content. Okay. And so I actually do expect in a high maths, high engineering kind of context that you're going to lose students. That's okay. In fact, it's impro it's appropriate to maybe get into the content early because yeah. if they're not going to vibe with the content that's, but we, we identified probably two or three things that he was like, Oh, duh. Like I, I just, he hadn't thought of these. Like, yeah, he wanted to do something to learn the students' names. He was not trying to not engage the students by not knowing their names. And by the end of the class, right. When he had the 10 students left over or whatever, he knew their 10 names but he just hadn't thought to make that a concerted effort in week one. This is an engagement practice, folks. I mean, I just yeah. just day one here. We don't need to be coming up with super, super duper uh, ed tech tool or finding, you know, uh, something expensive to answer this. It doesn't have to be a master's degree. Learn your students' names. That's one of the first ways you can engage them. Use their names. That makes them seen. That makes them feel like they're a part of the process. Um, it makes them feel more open. And, and, and in the same time, invite them to use your name and talk to you. And, you know, it's mm -hmm. like start a conversation with these people who are sitting in seats in front of you. That's yeah. that's the basic principle that that helped him. And one of the one of the few easy things he tackled. 
Uh, but like when we're thinking about student engagement outside of that, like so here he is thinking in the course of one one class, but that practice can now go to all of his teaching. And when yeah. we're thinking of student engagement, like Nearpod yeah. or Pear Deck, even Cami, now that we're aware of Cami, uh, well, we will be aware they're, of Cami next aware episode. Of Cammy yet. Yeah. Surprise. Future. Ooh. Da, da, da. Da, da, da. Fourth wall. Um, but like there's tools we can do to engage. But we yeah. can also just acknowledge that we're humans and the teacher and the learner are both in a room together and we need to yeah. engage one another. Well, what I like about that story is that like, OK, the guy's not a jerk. He's not um, trying to not learn their names or not caring. There are definitely those professors right. out there. Um, and uh, but they're not. And I think that's more of an average story of professors and the people teaching is that like so i'm i i think i thought of this very simple thing ready i'm gonna throw this at you this is my this is my hot take okay yep. for a second you ready increase in student engagement is is simple okay you increase in student engagement by caring about the student more than you do your content that's that's simple like it's basically like start with that principle can i, can I tweak it because <laughs> I, I like it i like yeah, this but okay, I, I might tweak okay. it Okay, you'll be One wrong. Of the things that go I, ahead and tweak. I'm just no, trying. no, I think you're going to like this. I <laughs> okay. think you're going to like this, right? So, because what you just did, and, 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 we're just having the podcast here, so there's no finger pointing, but what you just did is you kind of equated these things. Now there's this uh, there's this fight, there's this battle between oh, content. Well, right. well, I'm creating so, a false dichotomy, what, some might say, uh, in my statement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. No, no, no. I think what the faculty do need to do is care less about the content. Once they're teaching, once they're, they need to do everything up to the point of becoming a teacher and building their course. The, co the content is going to be first until the students are in the room. The content is first. When you go out to get your doctorate in mechanical engineering, the content is first. That's what's that's what's driving you. Yeah, that's yeah, what's yeah. intriguing that's you. That's that's your that's your number one love. And when you're writing your syllabus and when you're picking your textbook, the content is first in many ways. I think you should probably still be thinking about your student when you're picking your materials, but once you get in the classroom, they are first. The content should be done. <laughs> Josh, <laughs> Josh, we both know it's not. Josh and I both what? know the content what? is not done. No, not but. at all. And, and also, like, let's be fair, right? Like, it depends on the classes we're talking about teaching. Like, designing online courses and stuff, content should be done. Please be done <laughs> before it starts. We're begging you. We're, we're begging we're you. We're on our okay? knees. But like, like I'm teaching a face, like I'm teaching a face to face course this semester. And like, I have it, I have it planned out and I will have most of the content and stuff built in, but like my lesson plans and stuff for each lesson or how I'm organizing that adapts as I go through the course. Right. I don't, I'm not required to write yeah. them all ahead yeah. of time. So I don't, um, but I, I <laughs> plan out. Right. So like uh, there's, there's a piece, but I think there's an important emphasis you're giving. You're right. I do like it. You know, you, you're not wrong. Um, I do, I, I do, I do like the point. I Sorry, was creating man. this kind of false, this, uh, this pitting them against each other. Like you, you can't care about both um, right. at the same time. But I think maybe a better wording would be once it comes to actually starting to teach the student, focus on the student yeah. more than you do focusing yes. on the exact content that you're delivering or imparting or trying to get them to learn focus on caring about how the, who the student is and who you want to help them become at the end of the course. Right. Yeah. Like if the, seeing that as being your goal, not just being about, I need to give them all this information, but about being, I want to help them become something different at the end of the course, I think repackages it to start to look at the person and the student that you're teaching, not just as somebody that you're trying to get to remember things and, and know things, but actually think differently and act differently and be different by the end is going to cause you to also care more about who they are, where they're at at the beginning and where they're at throughout the rest of the course. Right. It's like, that's that those elements, I think really, push more student engagement at the end of yeah. the day uh, of what they're doing. Yeah. Like Laura, the, Laura in um, episode 110 was telling us that though of, of the social emotional learning, the SEL stuff, right? Like the more she had those students um, 
engaging with their own emotions and just communicating with her, the more engaged they were like, like yeah. these practices we've been hearing from some of our guests and stuff across the spectrum. We're not trying to like, we have not been curating this intentionally folks. We've just been talking to cool people. Yeah. Um, and, and this is all coming together where we're hearing like, I, I think a big reminder that the students are human and we have to be addressing them that way. Engage them in the process of learning like humans. Yeah. Um, in many cases, they're at least mildly adults. You know, they are they are self autonomous <laughs> people. Like I'm, I'm kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Maybe they're they're just like they just do what you tell them to do. I don't know. I'm not a K one through two teacher. Forgive me for over speaking. But like yeah. third grade, they've got a huge personality and they are going to tell you the what for maybe probably even second grade still too. But once we get to, to college students, like, yeah, we're going to still, we're always going to have behavioral issues, attitudinal stuff, but talk to them. They're humans. Yeah. I remember a very important lesson on student engagement from my first class teaching. Now, thankfully my first class teaching in, in higher education, excuse me, in higher education, I actually had a, a mentor teacher. Right. I was it was a whole thing, but I wasn't like the I was one of two teachers on record and I had my master's degree in process. I forget what it was, but I couldn't just be the teacher. So I had a mentor teacher and I appreciated that because when I got to at one point in the the semester, I was like, hey, things aren't going great with like how I planned it. What do I do about this whole literally a chunk of the, the, the syllabus as quizzes or something? I was like, I don't think I can build these or get these done. I really just going. I don't think I can do it. He's like, why don't you go talk to the students about it? I was like, well, I came to talk to you. You're my mentor. You're like a veteran teacher. You've been teaching at this school for 15 years. And I was like, no, you need to talk to the schools about it. I have my ideas, but want go talk to the students. And I, I just felt that really challenging. I'm like, oh, wait a second. Involve them in the teaching process. Invite them into it. And I remember being really scared about that. I mean, this is literally the first time I'm teaching in higher education. And I go into that classroom I'm like, all right, guys, I'm going to do something real, real scary. I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't think we can accomplish this portion of the syllabus. If I take that out, it can hurt this, this, and this. I, I showed them how the curriculum was written. I was like, if I take this out and we don't do this work, you may get less in this and may get less in you know different topics and stuff. I was teaching linguistics. And uh, I was like, what we can do if I take this chunk out is really put an emphasis on this and do more project time. Da, da, da. And I provide them options. We talked it through and they agreed that we should remove the work. What was fortuitous about that was I built a good relationship with them. It helped me start to learn more about mm -hmm. them, start to learn more about teaching. Um, but like ironically here, about two weeks later, my dad died and I couldn't finish teaching that course. So there's a lot of really, I, I eventually went back and finished the last few weeks. Um, but it was a shocking moment in my life here where the next teacher coming in, I hadn't built the quizzes. <laughs> I hadn't <laughs> built them. <laughs> they didn't exist. I would have been screwing over the next teacher coming in yeah. to take over for yeah. me who, who stood, in, stood in the gap while I was going through grief. Um, uh, but, you know, we got that out of the way and the teacher was able to take take up what I was designing and, and deliver what I yeah. did get to. And I was able to come back and finish the semester. And when I came back, um, there was really just this amazing awareness from the students, not only of the fact of the grief I went through, but of, like of the person that I was. And they treated me very well coming back for those last weeks of that semester. I just remember that, that standing out to me of like, I took an effort. I made myself vulnerable and it's like, hey, let's just see what we can do with this. And how do you think? And and they responded very well. But it happened in one of the most traumatic times of my life, and came to such a good result for that class. Right? I'm, I'm not I'm not going to get into the trauma and the <laughs> everything I have in my life. Yeah. But for that class, I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't been vulnerable. A for the, the my my substitute teacher, um, but B for those students and what their experience would have been like losing their teacher suddenly and the curriculum changing and shifting around and um, very thankful that you know I know their final projects were awesome and and most of them went on to be um, at least to start off as English language teachers, which is what I was uh, the program I was a part of. So I don't know. I felt like all that played in there, but the engagement part was. <laughs> 
<laughs> was pretty important to me about seeing how it worked and seeing the yeah. way it impacted the students. The the key is human connection and and leaning into that and getting to know the students and and working to consider the students and what you do and and how you do it. Like going back to uh, Sharon's episode, like I keep referencing back in this one, but the concept of like, would, would I want to do this? Will this, will students actually benefit from this uh, in her way asking, will they be uh, exciting at, or interesting at parties? I still love that. Be interesting at a party. Uh, will they be interesting <laughs> at a party because of this? Right. But like considering that stuff ahead of time, it's not that complicated. And I think, yes, human relations are complicated and this, I'm not saying this is super easy to do and connect yeah. with, but it's, I think easy to start considering and thinking and working at it. And it's not some, expert strategy about the number of activities we do or the 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 things we add into our colleges or the number of people that we keep hiring <laughs> to strategize <laughs> engagement um there's it's about uh. <laughs> the teacher supported teachers who can connect with their students who care about their students and who have the space to be able to do that in their courses and this is in online, face-to-face, -face, hybrid, whatever the heck you want to call it, blended, flipped, magic, I don't know, whatever model All we're talking, above. right? Like, th this is this is what we need in those areas. And I, I, I think why this interests me so much and why I think it's important to keep having these conversations is because I see it so often, right? When engagement's not the right way or they don't retain students the right way, the the... I see too quickly the responses being to, okay, well, how can we tweak the, this happens in online courses all the time. How can we tweak the number of things they're doing? Or like, how does this compare uh, to what the other institution is doing? That's not like, going to engage them where, folks. Like where it's no, it's that you need to engage and motivate the students, right? Yeah. Like that's at the end of the day, in all of my courses, what motivated me the most was not necessarily the topic content like some some topics interested me or right. i cared about them yeah. i was passionate about it so it got them in there but i would lose motivation very quickly if it was not a teacher or a professor that i felt cared or interacted with me we've said this multiple times there are topics that we could have cared less about but somehow i got excited about them because i loved the person teaching the course they took time to care and engage and jump in and if we want to get students engaged and excited about learning it starts with how we work with our professors and our faculty to support and train them in doing this and yeah. that's where we need to put energy in and i and i think it's important to keep hammering that home because i don't see that happening in higher ed i see different things happening um and strategizing and the right marketing plans and the right uh if we hire this right support system that that will come around them is all strategic about how they do it. Like there's, I'm getting, now I'm getting a little cynical, sarcastic and a little annoyed at what I see happening. Nah. And I get that right. Like, so, but, and, but and I understand there's places for balances between some of these things, but at the end of the day, we need to focus on what do the students want and need and how do we help our faculty understand that and give them the space to be able to connect with the humans that they are with, whether it's an online face-to-face, -face, whatever it is, how do we yeah. enhance that connection and that feeling of that the person helping you learn doesn't just care that you know what they're talking about, but cares about who you are when you walk inside the classroom and outside the classroom. If we could focus on that, that will help engage students and motivate students. Uh, to continue into what they're learning and, and cause them to be more passionate about what they're working on. Yeah. Yeah. Josh and I live, um, <clears throat> I, I want to say in a pretty small County. Like I, I don't, it's a very agricultural County. So there's a lot of farmland, which I think reduces potential for, you know, people, pe numbers of people to live. But, yeah. uh, the Not point being cows, that in people. our plenty of cows, high plenty GDP cows. cows, but yeah. Student, uh, new and student engagement plan cows. <laughs> sorry i took you off the train we we're a small county and we have like a dozen institutions of higher education and i see all of their uh, uh marketing teams investing in billboards i'll see i'll see competitors billboards like down from each other on the oh, same 100%. road you know what i mean and they're all like um, very similar pictures of people standing over a desk 
with like a Ugh. computer or yes. like somebody just like enjoying his life on a couch, drinking coffee, yep. working on a class. First of all, just side note. If you have actually sit on a couch and been drinking coffee while also working with one hand on a keyboard, I want you to call me and tell me because I don't believe that those people really exist. They're not. And there. his number is 717-555-5555. Hit us up at inbox at hightechpod.us and tell us if there you, you go. type with one hand while drinking on a drinking coffee on your proof. couch working on schoolwork. And I want photo proof. Uh, anyway, yeah. sorry. Continue. No, no, just the point being like all the money that goes into marketing and that lead effort to get the students engaged with the lifestyle, we want to sell them there. Just, I was talking, I was actually kind of counseling, uh, just suggesting to a, a parent of a, of a former student of mine this last week, ran into him at market. I was like, oh, you know, is your son considering college? Yeah, yeah, he's, he's really interested in this, that, and the other thing. I was like, oh, great. Have you had the chance to do college visits? Yes, of course, we're doing this. And then my next question was, and I was like, slash encouragement was, is he getting to meet the faculty? Is is he spending time with the program chairs and stuff like that? Like when you're doing these college visits, please, please, please don't tell me you're just like popping on, popping off. Like I would really encourage you and him to look at who is he going to learn from? Who is his program chair? Who are the teachers? Because that is to me what makes or break an education. If those teachers care, if those teachers are engaged, if they're experts in their field, great. But if they're also engaged, then, you know, his, your son, you know, talking to this guy, he's going to be so much more ready to succeed because college is not what it was for most parents these days anymore. Like what, what most parents today went through is not what college is today. And you have to make sure that because the students aren't what what the students used to be either. Everybody changes and that's OK. But we need to make sure that people going into these things are ready to know what to look for. And that is today engaging teachers, the, the people who are making the effort to reach their students where they are, uh, because if you don't, you're, you're going to go into like a prestigious program and your, your kid's still going to drop out with all this student loan debt that that's worthless. It's not going to turn anything for them. So, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, we're pretty much making up um, an image of a faculty member as like this chivalrous knight, you know, yeah. some sort of. Yeah. Some sort of. Which is also probably just valiant, uh, in valiant some ways. person. Yeah. But but a knight, if you will, like we, yeah. you know, we everybody's a project, you know, so <laughs> we we. We we transition. One day you become a knight. <laughs> I don't know. We are transitioning to our app for this wonderful episode called Night Lab Projects, and this will be about the last time you hear from me about this app <laughs> because this was a this was a will special added to our thing, and I have not carefully looked at it beforehand. Um, I'll be honest. So, will yeah. Night Lab. What projects. do we got? What do we got? Yeah. Night, Night Lab. Night Lab is a project out of Northwestern University. So if you go to Night Lab, and that's night as in Knigget, K N I G H T, yes. not as night as in armored dark. warrior from Middle Ages. And the night as, as knee. Yes, not the darkness that you see when the sun goes down. Correct. So nightlab.northwestern.edu. <laughs> uh, it is actually an open source. Um, series of projects that you can use kind of JavaScript and, and HTML packages to put into your websites and make cool stuff, right? So you don't have to pay money, but you do have to have some technical expertise. Sorry, folks, if you're not familiar, or if you don't have a WordPress or something where you can make some sort of like fun HTML work, this may not be as relevant for you. But if you have the technical wherewithal and you um, have the time, it is free. What is it? Night Lab is a, a series of projects that was intended to make information meaningful. meaningful. And, and their mission there is actually to promote quality journalism, storytelling, and content. I love that. The, fu the funny thing for me is I actually came across this probably in 2018, maybe 2019. I'm not too techy. I honestly haven't even set one up yet. But I've since been introduced to it, actually seen newspapers use it. 
I've seen private websites use it. Um, I actually have wrote down an example of somebody who in, in the ed tech sphere who wrote, um, and now it's going to kick me that I didn't write down who this was. Do I have a source? Oh no. Dang it. They wrote down the history of ed tech and they used one of the night lab, uh, timeline projects to make it. So literally their timeline starts in 1000 BCE, um, Back and when moves the VR headset forward. was first created. Exactly. Right. Yep. Uh, it moves forwards to like the 100s BCE with the oral communication and lecture, then the abacus in a long time ago, and then it goes <laughs> forward to <laughs> in a long print. time ago. <laughs> I don't know, man. Like that was the, the timeline itself dates. <laughs> gets eventually to the magic lantern being used in the 17th to 19th centuries to communicate information on on yeah. projection. The example is really cool, but the tools that you have that help you make your storytelling more effective are as follows. And just a couple of highlights. The storyline or timeline tools. Both of them let you create a chronological visual representation of time. The timeline for something like what I was just referencing, right? So the history of ed tech over time, uh, the, the United States of America, right? Like you make a timeline of something and then you can put like pins over the time and then you can put in uh, media and, and it could be pictures and videos. Um, lots of really cool media and information. It looks super clean. The storyline example, you know, is much less about like what happened over time, but like a story does happen over time. So there's still like a visual bar graph experience of how the story has ebbs and flows, but it's more about like a story of something as it's happened statistically, maybe like, um, I can't think of any great examples. I can only think of bad examples, so I don't want to touch those, but just how has the statistical likelihood of students getting good grades increased over time? That might be a story you would use their storyline tool for. They've got a really cool one called juxtapose that actually lets you put two pictures over top of each other and it builds a slider into it. So you can move the slider from left to right and the pictures are meant to be like, um, you know, a map of, of an area from one time in history and then the same area at a different time in history. So then they can click the slider and drag it from left to right and they can see, um, you know, London in 1865 and then they can you know, move the slider over and see London in 1965, right? And it's got the same picture and it, and it reveals the differences between these two, ting, two things. These are some really cool um, tools that, again, bring your, your educational content or even just corporate media, corporate content, some new life. You know, you can make stuff that's that's really snazzy and it's copy and paste work. Like you get to put stuff into some spreadsheets. You put the pictures in certain places. You know, it's all kind of, I'd say, bootstrapped um, open source approach. But that means anyone can use it. Your students can use this to make presentations. You can use this to make learning content for them. Um, one of the things I, I always loved about this uh, that we we were helping a faculty member do in uh, my last at my last institution was story mapping. So um, they were working on fictional stories. They actually came to us and they're like, hey, so here's J.R.R. Tolkien's map of Middle Earth. And I want to have students make maps like this and create a, a narrative around their, their map. So we had to find a map making tool. But then once we had the map made, we, we wanted it to be more than just flat. So we had the maps go into story map where the students could create um an interactive map experience about this fictional world they were creating and map making was an important part of the course, help the students understand narrative, how maps impact story writing. If you're not familiar, right? A lot of authors write their maps very early in their story writing process. If they've got a large world, because they want to keep that map in mind as they do their writing. So there's a ton of applications for this. There is a top six, uh, projects that they have. There's a couple beta projects that they're working on and they, they're they built out of Northwestern University. So it's an educational process. Like it's probably students in a studio class experience working on these, building these over time and then making them freely available for anyone to use. Josh, I've talked now 
for so long. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Do you have any questions, insights, something you can say so I can take a drink? I no, I really just want to keep you talking about it. No, I, I think it's really cool. I I love the different options that they have. And I love the focus being about how information is communicated and visualize in ways like so i i think it's cool i don't have a lot more to add about it other than i think definitely check it out uh and take a look at it like will did say it's you have to be a little bit more techie to use it this is one of our more techie tools but it's free and uh i think if you're willing to check it out it, it never hurts to look at it and see could this be something i could use to visualize or communicate information and if so there's always ways to figure out that extra techie stuff right like it's not like there's not tutorials things on the internet on how to use this these types of tools uh, or take a look at it i would highly uh, recommend checking it out so like will said nightlab.northwestern.edu uh, you can go check it out and then they've got more information about each of the different options that they have there i'm a i'm a sucker for timelines so i like looking at the timeline option personally um and <laughs> Josh like, how can i put this in our website <laughs> yeah how can i use this so um i want to i want to cool. answer or, or read a couple of two two of their frequently asked questions so like just for their juxtapose project right so they've got six yeah. projects they could all be a little different but here's a frequently asked question under their juxtapose project do i need to know code to use juxtapose js answer absolutely not juxtapose js is friction free if you have links to two images you're ready to use juxtapose js so literally you just need two google images or two links or something you can use that tool can you customize it yes but then you need to know code right so you can use it stock as is get going easy you want to customize it you need to be able to write some code um, they've got a help section under each of their tools. And so you can kind of find out like, is this tool going to work well for me or not? Um, I bet you there's people out there that can help you with this, but Hey, email us at inbox at high us. If you want to use this in your classroom, you're not sure how we want to help you. Seriously. I think that Josh and I could easily figure this kind of stuff out and get you the information you need to get going. And heck, maybe we make a YouTube video about it and it goes out there for other people to use this as well. Like these are meant to be tools that are free. So if there's a free way to help you get to learn how to use this, I uh, want to make sure that that's available in email us inbox at hightechpod.us. That's what this podcast is for. Yeah. I, I think that's it, man. Right. We've got yeah, absolutely for folks to look at. That is the episode. So what is next on the high tech podcast that is going, I I'll take this will cause you talked a lot <laughs> during this last part of the episode. This would normally be the part where you would take it, but I will talk about it. Thanks. Man. So uh, Thanks. what's next on the high tech podcast episode 113? We are joined by another guest that we are so freaking excited about. Um, Steve Martinez is going to be joining us. Uh, he is our new our new friend of the High Tech Podcast, who I'm sure will return to the High Tech Podcast because this yes. episode was a blast. Steve joined us to talk about flipped the flipped classroom, what he's done, and talk a little bit about the app that he comes from. I keep wanting to say Kami because it's what we've been saying forever, and I know it's Cammy, 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 Cammy. Gosh, I'm sorry. We've been saying it that way, and I can't like get it out of my mind when I need yep. to say it. Cammy, which is a new tool that I am absolutely checking out. We have not looked at it much in the High Tech Podcast up to this point, and Steve definitely sold us on it. Uh, but we talk about the flip classroom with Steve, and you will not want to miss this episode. This is a fantastic episode that goes down many different roads. Uh, but will definitely influence the way that you teach if you give it a give it a listen. So that's gonna be our next episode. As a, again, a reminder, you can find us on Twitter. I'm still gonna call it Twitter slash YouTube at High Tech Podcast, <laughs> and you can email us inbox at hightechpod.us, and you can also find our website hightechpod.us as well. Reminder: on our website, we throw up episode pages bunch of information some new ex cool stuff coming up on that website so make sure to check it out and if you haven't already i didn't mention this when i mentioned youtube but please go subscribe to youtube and check out the videos if you're listening to us uh in audio format on your podcast tool that is fantastic but also go check out youtube we drop uh clips youtube shorts information about episodes 
all gets thrown up on YouTube and it is a great spot to check out some of our shorter information and maybe some other cool previews of what's coming up in future episodes. So make sure to subscribe to us over there. Thank you again for joining us for another week as we continue to look what it looks like to harness technology, engage students in the classroom, whether online or in person. See ya. See ya.